So all set at the back. Fantastic. So um, there's some paper going around. So as before, I'd like you to write down just something you got from the lecture, uh, a question that arises from the lecture, and, and your name if you want to win a book. Um, so we'll start today just by, um, and what I want to do today is, is, is continue some of the stuff I didn't get to in the second lecture. So we, we talked a little bit about totality and the importance of totality, and we talked about um, generating or, or building proofs and predicates and why it was important for these to be uh, terminating and total. One thing we didn't look at was the other side of totality. So we haven't talked about programs which run forever or run for a long time. So, so a, th a thing you often hear people ask about, a very reasonable thing that people ask about, and actually some of you wrote on your pieces of paper this very question, is um, termination is all very well, but servers run forever, operating systems run forever, or you know, as, uh, practically forever, um, and, and you know, read eval print loops run forever. So how does that fit in with the notion of totality? So we'll look at that today, and we'll look a, a bit more at dealing with state, because in, 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 in reality, it's lovely to think about um, you know, the properties, the functional properties of programs and, and guaranteeing that the programs have exactly the right behavior. But in reality, we have to interact with the outside world. So we look at ways that we can use the type system to, to reason about what's going on in the way our programs interact. Uh, but first, I'll look at a few questions from, uh, from the last uh, lecture. Uh, so one thing I should say, actually, um, there is... Um, uh, so William, where is he? There he is. William has started this uh, OPLSS notes thing on, on GitHub that you might have seen, which is a fantastic idea. Uh, all of the questions that people wrote down, I've, I've made a note of them. Some, sometimes I've summarized them, sometimes I've merged them a bit. But I've put down, I've, I've written down the questions, I've put them into that repository, and it would be great if people started contributing answers to those questions. So there's, some of them clearly I'm going to have to answer, but some of them I think it would be good if, if, if people just added their own thoughts to the notes. So I think that would be a, a valuable uh, thing for everybody to do. Um, also, I've noticed one thing. People ask particularly brilliant questions if not forced to ask them in front of the room. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's keep doing that, it's great. <laughs> so uh, I've picked some of the most, the most relevant, the most interesting and the funniest for, uh, for, for these uh, slides. So very important question, what limitations does totality impose for practical programming? Um, so at the minute, the difficulty is that uh, just deciding, deciding termination is, um, well, okay. Uh, Deciding termination is something we're never going to be able to do in general, but, but people, are, um, uh, uh, pe people are working hard at ways of, of, of getting uh, machines to do better at this. So at the moment, it means you have to think about what is the structure of a program? How do I show that this, this program uh, reaches some base case? So sometimes uh, it gets more difficult than it really needs to be. So although, although um, aiming at totality is a good thing, it shouldn't be the be-all and end-all of, of, of programming. If, if you have to do something, if you have to come up with some external proof that your program terminates, Idris is happy for you to do that. So Idris will, um, uh, in particular, Idris allows you to assert that something is total if, um, if you know better than the machine. So there's a couple of functions. Um, uh, in fact, if you look at my example code, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see one or two. Uh, so there are functions that allow you to say, no, I know better than you here. I just want to get on with my programming. So, so th there are the limitations that you have to work harder to persuade the machine. But recognizing that, we do let you bypass the machine's checker. Um, is it possible to write partial p functions and prove to totality later? So there's an annoying answer to this question, which is that if it's a partial function, then you're not going to be able to prove it's total. <laughs> Uh, I, think what you, what, I think what's meant by this question is, is it possible to write functions that the machine doesn't believe is total and then come back to them later? And absolutely it is. Uh, you can either do this by sticking in assertions, so uh, asserting that something is getting smaller, or there are techniques um, that I'm not going to cover in the next couple of lectures because there's not enough time, but there are techniques that, 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 uh, that have been explored using um, uh, accessibility predicates, so that's the phrase you should uh, look up. Uh, well-founded induction uh, and so on that, that, that can help you do these proofs. So you can take a program that uh, the machine doesn't believe is total and do a little bit of work to explain why it's total. Um, how is impossible defined? So we saw the, in this, uh, this idea of um, showing that something can't happen, show, showing, that, showing that something returns an element of the empty type by saying that, uh, explicitly saying that a case is impossible. So how is it defined that someone asked, you know, is it a type? Well, it's not a type, it's a bit of syntax. And it's a bit of syntax that says, 
this case, this, this, this left-hand side, this pattern, is not well-typed. So it's just a, a bit of syntax that says to the machine, this is not well-typed, and you tell me if you think actually it is well-typed or it has the potential to be well-typed if, if unification proceeds a certain way. Uh, can I use it in a case expression? Yes, you can. So um, I wasn't actually sure of the answer to this, so I've just gone and tested it. And just as with any other pattern, if you've got, if you've got case patterns, write impossible next to it, and the same thing will happen. The machine will check um, whether, whether it's well-typed. Uh, how does it deal with universes? So basically meaning, what is the type of type? Um, so uh, if, you, if you go to the Idris prompt and ask for the type of type, what you will see is type has type, type 1. There isn't actually any syntax for type 1. So and it, Idris never, never actually prints the full details of what a type is. So internally what happens is Type has type type 1, type 1 has type type 2, type 2 has type type 3, and so on, all the way up as far as practically imagine it. Um, and if, um, if you have something in type n, then it's OK to say that that's in type n plus anything for any, for any uh, non-zero number, or greater than zero number. Um, so, this, so essentially, it has cumulative universes. Um, so, but, uh, but as far as you're concerned as programmers, all you have to think about is the type of type is type. Um, and if, there, if, if any inconsistencies arise, then the type checker will tell you. So I'm not going to go any further into that, but if that's the sort of question that, uh, uh, if you're concerned about how universes work, essentially look at uh, uh, cumulativity. So, so it's essentially the way that, uh, that, that COP does the, the, the same thing. Uh, so a couple more. Um, can you say more about how erasure works? So I've, I've mentioned erasure a couple of times, and that, that Idris really takes uh, the idea of erasure seriously. So really is... Um, looking for um, things which are never inspected. So, so values which are, um, or, or variables which are never subject, the subject of, um, uh, of a case split, uh, essentially. So the way it works is for every function, um, there is a set of constraints generated that uh, this, uh, if this function is called, this particular variable uh, is inspected. And this builds uh, a set of constraints, a whole program set of constraints, which are then solved to establish which inputs to the program are never looked at across the whole program. So essentially, it's a constraint problem. Um, and if you, you're, you're um, from, from a programmer's point of view, there's, um, the question is then going to be, well, how do I control that? How do I know what's being erased and what isn't? So the way to control it is, um, well, the, if you, if you, don't write the value in your program, Idris makes the assumption that you don't want it in the generated code. So it will use that as a starting point for generating the constraint set, that this is, this is a thing I don't want to look at. If it finds out that um, it actually has to look at the thing that you didn't write in your program, then, well, it will generate it in the resulting code. So it, it, it won't erase things that can't be erased. At the minute, it does so silently. Now, the, this is part of a sort of path to adoption thing. It's a quite a tricky thing to explain. So we don't make this, uh, we, we don't make this a requirement of, 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 um, of, of programs that, 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 that erasure is as you uh, claim. But you can turn on the warning. To, to, so you can turn on the, the, the flag dash dash warn reach. And what that does is, tells you if something you haven't written in the program turns out to be uh, reachable and will be ending up in your code. So uh, this isn't really documented very well yet, and this isn't really something we've explained very well yet. And the main reason for this is the diagnostics are currently really quite terrible. Um, and so once we figured out how the diagnostics will work, uh, essentially once uh, my student Matush has, has, has written his thesis, this will all become a lot, uh, a lot uh, sort of better presented. But for the moment, if you, if you want to have um, some idea of, of which bits of your program are not being erased but should be, try the dash dash one reach flag and, and, and see what happens. So essentially, when, if, you have a, if you have an unbound implicit argument, so these are the things where you've got the names in types, the, the names beginning with lowercase letters in types that are implicitly being bound, the assumption is you want that erased. And if it turns out not to be true, uh, you can turn on dash dash one reach to tell you. Got one of the sillier questions now. Where can I get a t-shirt that says it type checks ship it? Well, to my knowledge, there is only one such t-shirt. Uh, I got it off a place on the internet that does custom t-shirts. Um, I, I, I didn't start selling the design anywhere because um, I don't really want people to wear that t-shirt without and, and actually believe it. Um, <laughs> 
so, so the rule is you're not allowed to, 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 to have such a t-shirt unless you can explain why it's not actually true. Um, <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's not a difficult piece of design. So, you know, if you want to make such a T-shirt, you know, I'm not going to be offended. Um, and uh, are you Scottish? Because you don't sound Scottish. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm actually from uh, Northumberland in the north of England. It's the northernmost county in England. Uh, I've lived in Scotland for 12 years. I'm not a Scottish citizen because there is no such thing as Scottish citizenship, <laughs> at least not yet. <laughs> um, however, um, the landlord at my local pub calls me an honorary Scotsman, which is the next best thing. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Right. Um, let's let's. Um, well, let's. Yeah, we should have a competition because I've got another ebook code to give away, and um, I think well, I'm going to do the same again. I'm just going to shuffle this stack of papers until someone gives me an appropriate random number, and then I'll count down to that number. So anyone anyone have a good random number generation? Was that five? Someone said five, that'll do. One, two, three, four. This one, that's uh, Jose Abel. Abel, Abel, Abel. Ah, right in front of me. There you go. If, um, if the code doesn't work, I'll write it down with something, something legible. Uh, OK, so tomorrow's prize is a real book, so that's even more exciting. Right, so what I want to do uh, is go back to um, total programming, go back to um, uh, termination, and go a bit further, go on to productivity. So, so a couple of people did ask in their, um, in their written questions, how about streams, how about productivity? So let's, let's, just, go to, let's just go to that as an example. So um, uh, again, you can get this yourself. So I'm probably going to go a little bit too quick today for you to keep up with the... Um, uh, the coding I'm doing, but these are all available, and uh, you know you can try them in a hands-on session later on. So, um, data type we're going to look at is uh, this is defined in the Prelude, so it's 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 just available to you. It's the the type of streams. So streams are um, essentially infinite collections of uh, of things, and they are defined as only a cons. So there's we've seen lists, we've seen vectors which had nil and cons. Uh, streams only have cons. Streams can only get bigger. So there's immediately the question of how on earth do you ever make one of these things? Well, we make one of these things bit by bit. They, 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 are, they are potentially infinite structures. We can build, we can explain how to construct them, and if we start deconstructing them, we can only deconstruct some finite prefix of it. So if you remember when I said, when I was talking about what, what does it mean to be a total program, uh, a total program is um, so a, a program that either terminates or it constructs the finite uh, non-empty prefix of uh, some value. So streams are uh, its cons. We've got some value of some type LM. Then this inf, I'll come to what this means in a little bit more detail in a moment, but this, this essentially you can think of this as a modifier on a type that says this thing is potentially infinite. Doesn't mean it has to be infinite, but potentially infinite. So um, only in this case it will be. But uh, it, um, uh, and the, the, the practical effect of inf, well, two, two effects of inf. One is that it won't be computed until it's demanded. So it's like lazy evaluation. So it's lazily, it will lazily build the rest of the stream rather than uh, construct it uh, as soon as possible. And crucially, it means for the totality checker. The totality checker knows that this thing is potentially infinite. It's therefore not going to terminate. So a different rule applies. Uh, and the rule is you can only call um, something that is generating a potentially infinite structure if, it's, if you've already generated a constructor for, that, for it to be uh, a, an argument of. So we'll see this in practice. And uh, hopefully that will become a little bit uh, clearer. So just to start. Uh, we want to start by generating um, uh, an infinite stream. So I'm going to write this function count from, so which, given some natural number, will generate an infinite stream starting to count from that number. OK? So this is a function that we can write, well, um, just as, as, as we always have, Control-Alt-A to generate the candidate definition. So we're generating a stream of, um, of natural numbers starting from the number k. So, well, what is, what, what is this stream going to be? It's, it's, there's only one way of constructing a stream, and that's using the cons operator. And you, we're going to have to decide what the first value in this stream is. 
So if we're counting from k, I guess the first thing in the stream is going to be uh, k, and then we're going to generate some more of it. So if we check the type of uh, count from RHS, it says, right, we've got, a, we've got a NAT, and we're trying to build a bigger stream of NATs. Notice that it says stream of NAT and not inf stream of NAT. Slightly strange thing, I'll, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. But we're trying to generate a stream of uh, NATs uh, counting from k. We've already got k, so we're now recursively going to generate the infinite stream of NATs from uh, k plus 1. So it's k, and then we'll count, count from uh, k plus 1. So let's um, just try that in, uh, in the REPL. And this, this at first might be surprising. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the machine whether count from is total. And um, hopefully, it's going to do the right thing. Oh, there's one in, there's one in Prelude as well. Uh, so this is the one we're interested in. Main.countFrom is total, which is perhaps a bit strange at first, because this is not going to terminate. It's, it's going to generate an infinite thing. But let's try running it. Let's, let's try counting from, I don't know, 10, and see what it prints. And it says, rather than, rather than printing something that just goes on for ages, it says, well, I know the first thing is 10. And then the rest of it is going to be delay. So this is, this is where the inf comes in. It's going to be a delay. Like whenever, whenever you want to look at it, it's going to be a stream of things counting from 11. So this is what the type checker does when it sees inf and it tries to evaluate it. It says, well, I'm only going to look at what that actually is if, um, if someone asks for it. So it's worth, it's worth taking a look at what the type of... Uh, of delay is, and that that uh, hopefully explain any weirdness that uh, that's going that that that, that, that uh, you might be wondering about with uh, with int. So if we look at the type of delay, delay is a thing that takes a value and it constructs uh, a delayed value. Um, so what is delayed? Let's look at delayed. Let's look at the documentation for delayed. So this is. Um, this is the uh, underlying implementation of what's going on when you, have, when you have an inf type or when you have a lazy type. So it's, it's a delayed thing. There is some reason for the delay. That is, either it's just a lazy computation, something that we'll, comp that we'll compute when we're asked for it, or it's something that's been delayed because it's potentially infinite. And it's like we don't want to compute potentially infinite things right now, well, because they're potentially infinite. So it's got one constructor, delay, that's what, we've, uh, that's, what we've, that's what we've just seen. Um, and uh, is this a question? Is, so is delay and delay? Uh, delay is, oh, this, all it is is exactly what you see here, just a constructor. So uh, no continuations here. Just a, so there's, there's a little bit of runtime system trickery that, that is what forces it to actually get delayed. Um, so there's another side to delay, which is that if you have a delayed thing, at some point you might want to compute that delayed thing. So there is a, a function called force. So force takes, I'll, I'll put force and delay up together. Uh, delay takes a value and says, I'll compute it later. Force takes a delayed value and actually computes it. So the slightly weird thing is that you don't see either force or delay in here. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is that if you actually had to write force and delay everywhere, your programs would be very ugly and full of forces and delays. And the great thing about having type checking rather than type inference is that the machine knows what type is needed at a particular place. So it sees here, so in this, in this hole, it sees that it needs something of type inf stream, and it knows that to get to turn an inf stream into a stream, then it will... Uh, sorry, to turn a stream into an in stream, it will delay it. So it's implicitly adding the delay. So we could, if we really want to, we could make that delay explicit, and it would be just as happy, just wouldn't have in implicitly inserted it. So. Um, you said counting streams in an stream, so a stream without inf is not an So this, this count from k plus 1, that's, um, that is a stream, because count from returns the stream. But this cons, this needs, rather than a stream, it needs inf of stream. So you do need to put the delay in there to turn a stream into an inf of stream. But the type checker will insert that for you implicitly. So essentially, you're ending up like you're, you're programming in a lazy language. You're not thinking about where things get, get forced and delayed. Uh, the machine is putting them in for you in this type-directed way. Um, there's another question. Is 
Oh, you could, yeah. So, so do you mean like having, having a Lambda abstraction that just takes a unit yeah. and then you could force it by providing that unit? That would work just as well. Would so the harder to have this sort of syntactic sugar just in this case? Well, so um, the real reason for doing this is, is because of this. So the slightly strange thing that there are two reasons for delaying. The fact that in this case, it's about productivity checking. In some cases, it really is just that you want to compute something later because, because it might be a big computation. So there's, there's two slightly different reasons, and it, it's, it's kind of nice to be able to, in the type, say, uh, to express the difference between those two reasons. So I think, I think you could probably even do that with a Lambda abstraction. It's just this, this, this was an easier way to implement it, and you can see directly what's going on by looking at the types of things. Uh, because they have uh, different effects for the uh, totality checking. Uh, we'll in, in, in a moment, we'll actually see a place where that's really important. So, uh, so we'll come back to that in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, there are two more questions. So I'll go <coughs> back and then to Rally. Yeah. So if it's called by name, do you have a update? Uh, so it's called by, hang on. Uh, yes, I think so, but I'll have to check. <laughs> It's intended to be called by need. It might be that the implementation doesn't work properly, but it's intended to be called by need. Um, uh, Rally. Uh, so it's delay or into, it's usually just normal constructed of some type of input that nobody can expect to even have to compute to count some data. Right. So, so the runtime has to know about. The special case. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, uh, the compiler knows that delay means, oh, I'd better make a thunk here. So, so it's, Idris is strict except for this one situation. Okay. So. Right, so um, the, the thing about, so what's going on here is we're making a potentially infinite thing and we're not generating the thing until we need it. So um, this, is why it's, this is why termination still works. Termination works because uh, we only generate these things uh, as they're required. So when are they required? Well, they're required, or how, how do we know when they're required? Um, so we'll use an infinite thing by providing some kind of input that causes us to generate the infinite thing. So I like to think of this as, as providing uh, fuel to make the computation run. So this is what uh, Conor McBride referred to as petrol-driven recursion. Uh, I, guess, I guess it's gas-driven recursion here. But um, uh, so, so in order to use this stream, in order to make this stream, we have to provide some fuel that allows us to make this stream. So let's do that. Um, if we wanted to, if it, the, the fuel to get some things out of an infinite stream, a, a, a natural way to do that might be to use a natural number to say how many things we want from the stream. So we'll do that by, we're taking the first um, some numbers from the stream and that turns it into a list. So a list, is, a list is a finite collection of things, a stream is an infinite collection of things. By the way, this is one of the things I, uh, I don't like about Haskell. Uh, is a list infinite or not? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so these are, uh, sometimes people, uh, one, one um, sort of minor complaint I've heard about Idris is that list and stream are different types and it's annoying to have to write different programs on these things because they're different types. And my answer is, well, yeah, they are different types, they're different things. And having different types for different things is good <laughs> because it means you use them right. So what's the problem? And then people usually say, oh, yeah. <laughs> right, so, um, uh, so what are, what are the first zero things from a stream? That's easy, zero, zero things. What are the first successor of k things from a stream? So we'll have to look at the first thing in the stream. So it's, it's the value and then it's the first k things from the rest of the stream. So this is, just, this is actually just take. So if you've seen the take function, it's exactly that, but on streams. So just to show how that works in practice, so we had this um, uh, counting from 10, but if I, if I now, t t uh, not take, first n. I mean, take would work because it's in the library, but let's, let's use the one we've just written. So taking the first, um, oh, I need to give a number. Um, we take the first five things from this stream. Now it's actually generated them. So, so by asking for something, it has, it has forced this uh, delayed stream and it's actually built the, built the, the thing. Okay. <laughs> Am I making sense here? Is that, are people okay with that? So I think uh, if, if you're familiar with Haskell, this is probably completely natural. 
because you do, you're, you're used to things being lazy and that's okay. Possibly a thing that's a little bit strange is that it's type-driven laziness. So there's, there's a thing in the type that says this is potentially infinite. So you do have to have this delay in force and just remembering that, that, that the delay in force is, is there even if implicitly is just something that, I mean, most of the time you don't have to think about it, but sometimes it, uh, uh, it comes up and is a little surprising. Now then, um, that's, that's sort of infinite things, but what about, what about infinitely running interactive programs? Because that, that, was, that was a thing that, um, that I promised, was that uh, by, by having infinite structures, we could potentially write programs which run forever, or at least for a very long time, um, and not have to worry about um, termination, but have to, or have to worry about termination of individual actions, but productivity of the whole program. So I need to say just a little bit about um, I.O. Now, here's, a, here's some programs that, that would be perfectly valid Haskell programs, but for the single colon. So um, the way I like to explain I.O. when I'm teaching people Haskell is um, I think sometimes um, there's, there's a sense that I.O. is somehow a magic thing. And it's some, sometimes people have the impression that Haskell can't be a pure language because it's got I.O. and isn't that cheating a bit? And well, no, it's not at all cheating. Uh, and the reason it's not cheating and the reason you should never let anyone get away with saying that it's, it's not pure uh, because it's got I.O. is there's a distinction that we don't really talk about between evaluating things and executing things. So if you go to your REPL, whether it be Idris or Haskell or whatever, you type in an expression, um, something happens, it gets evaluated, and then the result gets printed. So that's, that's, that's evaluation of an expression. But if it's an I.O. expression, something, at least in GHCI, something silent some, and magical happens, which is that GHCI notices that what it's computed is an I.O. action. And it says, right, this expression turned out to be an I.O. action, so I'm going to pass that on to the runtime system, and then you do something interesting with it. So the, so the distinction between what's being evaluated and what's being executed in Haskell is, uh, is silent. It's, it's just something that the runtime deals with for you. So I decided in Idris, we're not going to make this be silent. We're going to make this, this distinction absolutely explicit. And so if you type in something at the REPL, you will only ever, uh, by default, if you type an expression at the REPL, you will only ever get the evaluated form of that expression. It will not go and execute it for you. And that's really to make clear that I.O. is a perfectly ordinary thing. There's nothing special about I.O. I.O. is a type that describes the possible actions that a program can take. So we can even see this in practice. So, so we've, got a, we've got a program called hello here of type I.O. And, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to print a, print a, a number. Um, so if I, um, what do I call it, interact2, yeah. So if I um, load this up at the REPL and I type in hello, well, if you're, um, if you're used to GHCI, you'd expect it to just print the number uh, that it computes. What happens in Idris is it prints the I.O. actions, which when executed will print that number. So evaluating that gives you the, uh, the, the tree of I.O. actions that are, that are going to be done. And that's why, essentially, that's why I.O. is perfectly, a perfectly reasonable, pure thing to have. It's because I.O. IO of unit is nothing more than a collection or a sequence of I.O. actions or a tree of I.O. actions that, that, that when, when the runtime system gets hold of it, this is what it's going to do. So what's it going to do? It's going to... Um, it's going to write 42 in a new line, and then, and then it's going to return unit. So if I, do, if I do want to execute it, I can, but I have to explicitly say that I want you to execute this now. So colon exec of hello will compile that to, uh, to a C program. It'll then compile it to a binary, and then it will actually execute the I.O. actions. So, um, so the key thing here is, you know, this is uh, a crucial thing about type-driven development, I suppose, is where, where, where everything is explicit in the type. Um, I.O. is explicit in the type, um, so um, the distinction is there, but let's make the runtime system and the, and the REPL, or, or let, let's be absolutely clear about what that distinction is. Okay, is that okay? Is that, that, uh, I mean, if, if you're, certainly if you're used to programming in Haskell, that, that's quite a natural thing to you, and you don't really think about this separation, but there really is a separation, and it's, it's an important thing to think about um, as you're developing software and as you're thinking about uh, what the actions you execute might be. Yes, yeah, so question. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that's compiled, so there's no interpreter that's going to this 
Uh, no, this is, this is, if you do colon exec, it, it does generate a C program, compiles that C program. And that's why, by the way, that's why this takes uh, a second or two. Because, <laughs> you know, it should be quite quick to calculate this and print 42, but it's, it's going through this uh, process of going to the C compiler. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, but if I type, uh, if I, if I um, just evaluate it, that's, that is going to exactly the same evaluator that's used by the type checker. This is actually, uh, just as an aside, this is a really handy thing. So if you're, um, if you're trying to figure out how the type checker is going to behave in a particular instance, um, you can just look at the, you can go to the REPL and say, okay, what, what happens here if I, have, if I have some free variables? Let's put the free variables in. It will happily evaluate things uh, underneath uh, lambdas, for example. Um, so in fact, you can even see an example of this here. It's, it's, it's got a lambda here. So you'll... If you, if you try to evaluate something at the Haskell REPL, for example, you'll never see a lambda like that because it's, 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 it's compiling them and, uh, um, uh, and then running them. Right, so um, now, that we, now that we know how I.O. works itself, uh, the, the fact that it really is um, uh, a pure thing, that, uh, a, a, a sequence of actions that is being... I mean, conceptually, you can think of the runtime system as being, um, being an interpreter for I.O. actions. It isn't, because that would be ludicrously inefficient. But you can at least conceptually think of it that way, and that helps you know, think about everything that's going to happen, uh, going to happen next. So, um, so just as with uh, Haskell, there is a bind operator that allows you to take the output of one action, feed it to the input as the input of the next action. So echo here would just, uh, I, mean, I guess I could, uh, uh, if, I, if, I, if I execute echo, then I'll type something and it'll echo it back. So, so it'll, this, this takes the output of one operation and feeds it as the input to the next. And again, just like in Haskell, we have do notation, and do notation is just a nicer way of, um, of sequencing actions uh, using, using bind. So um, is do notation familiar to everyone? Would people like me to explain a bit more about what it is? Raise your hand if you'd like me to say a little bit more. OK, I won't say a little bit more. <laughs> um, so uh, now, if we look at this program, this, this is a program that is um, it's going to run forever, continually asking, um, you know, like a small child, continually asking people's names. Um, and and, and, and there's, there's an interesting property about this program is that, uh, well, it's going to run forever, but uh, because it's always doing some actions before it, before it loops around, it is a productive program, and it, it's a perfectly reasonable program to run. It's not going to—it's not going to go into any infinite loops that don't produce anything. So, so I, if I if I try executing it, you know, it's it's um, it's perfectly fine. Um, but if I ask for t uh, whether it's total, uh, it's not perfectly fine. The, the, the machine thinks, well, you know, this 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 program potentially has a problem because it's got a recursive path. There's no decreasing argument. And well, it's absolutely right. It's not going to terminate. But we know something more about it. We know that it's actually doing some actions. And it's definitely producing things before it goes into that loop. So the question is, how do we explain that sort of thing to the machine? And we kind of have a distinction that we need to think about between I.O. programs which definitely terminate and I.O. programs which don't terminate but might produce things on the way. So if we want to distinguish between things which need to terminate and things which could be productive, what are we going to do? Well, these two things, they're both sequences of I.O. actions, I mean, like lists. They're, they're lists are collections of things, streams are collections of things, but they're different types. And infinite sequences of I.O. actions are not the same type as finite sequences of I.O. actions. So what we're going to have to do is define the type of infinite sequences of I.O. actions and work with that. So that's exactly what we do. We, um, I've gone a little bit further here. I've, um, I've said, this is, so this is just a little bit like streams. This is like streams are a thing and then a potentially infinite uh, sequence of more things. So infinite I.O. programs, I've said that they are a command. So this is our thing. And then it's slightly more complicated. It's, it's, a, it's a potentially infinite sequence of more things but that potentially infinite sequence is computed from the result of this first command. So just like streams, but we've got this, uh, this sort of higher order argument here. So it's kind of more like a, a, a tree than a stream. So it's, it's, you sometimes hear these referred to as um, interaction trees, where 
the first thing is the first interaction, and then all the possible results get fed to the rest of the interactions. Um, so uh, this bind operator, uh, the, the translation from do notation to uses of the bind operator is completely syntactic. So all it does is turns the, 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 the binds and the commands into uh, applications of this function. If there happen to be lots of implementations of, of a function, then Idris will decide which one you mean um, by, well, conceptually by type checking all of them and seeing which, if exactly one of them works. It's actually a little bit cleverer than that. Um, so it, it will see that the only valid thing, uh, it will hope, well, try to find that the only valid thing is this one. The, this is the only thing that type checks. So we can write programs using the same notation, just using do notation, but it'll translate to this version of the bind operator rather than some other one. So if we've turned, uh, instead of do, we, we've implemented bind. And we can implement uh, our, our loopy IO program just as we did before, except now, if I load this version, um, so if I load this version and check whether it's total, it's, oh, I didn't mean that, I meant total. It now says this one is total. So why is this total but the other one not? Well, this one is total because it does some stuff and then it loops, and it's specifically because of this inf. So this inf says to the machine, uh, this is a potentially infinite program, and you are allowed to call something that is potentially infinite, provided you, you're, you're underneath a constructor, provided you've, provided you've done soft stuff first, which means that there is going to be a, a non-zero a uh, finite sequence before the infinite bit. So here is our non-empty non finite sequence of things before the potentially infinite bit. Here is the infinite bit. So if I were to you know, get rid of these three lines, I'm slightly scared to try this because uh, I've been tinkering with the... Uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's always entertaining to tinker with your compiler before you give a talk because uh, I've given this demo a few times before and if, if I know what's going to happen, it's no fun. So there's a sense of danger here. Um, hopefully, you're good, that's reassuring. Uh, so, so it says it's not total because there's nothing happening before the, the potentially infinite bit. There's, there's a, um, and you know, there, there needs to be something happening. And similarly, if I took this, uh, if I took this inf out, um, I think it would still type check, but it wouldn't get past the totality checker because um, it's not total because of the, of the recursive path. So in this case, because I don't, have, I don't have this statement that this program is potentially infinite, it says, I need to find some way of showing this as terminating. And uh, so by, by removing that inf, this is, now, this is now a terminating type, not a, not a potentially infinite type. Uh, question? So it's a little surprising to me that it wasn't total when you got rid of the inf, just because it seems like it won't produce that, um, that IO value until you give it an A. So it seems like it's kind of like the lambda abstraction. Yeah, but by... by not putting the inf in, I'm saying to the machine, I expect this to be terminating. And I have, if, if I want something to be going forever, I need to say to the machine, um, look, I expect this to go forever. And, and the machine is not going to decide by magic whether it's meant to be terminating or not. That's a decision for me to make, not for the machine to make. So in fact, I mean, it, just like the IO version, it would be perfectly reasonable. But let's imagine I want to include this as part of a larger program. If I want to include this as part of a larger program, it's quite important to have that distinction between infinite and non-infinite things. I, ne I need to know what's going to be infinite and what's not if I really want to reason about uh, the, the, the productivity of something. Anyway, once we have this, you know, I, we, we can't just run this. If I try, you know, call on exec loopy, it's going to say, well, that's no good because um, it's... <laughs> the, the reason for the error message is I'm not going to go into that, but it's, it's essentially the wrong type. I need, I need to find some way of driving this program. So I need... Well, I need some fuel to, to make it run. So one way to do it is to write uh, a little interpreter um, for uh, the potentially infinite programs. And the interpreter itself is not going to be total. So, well, I mean, let's, let, let's just do it. Let's, let's, let's write this interpreter. So how do I, how do I run uh, a potentially infinite interactive program? Uh, the only option I have at this point is, is a case split on, on, the, uh, on the, 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 the program. So let's do that. So it's, we've got a command, and then we've got the rest of the program. So um, we're going to have to somehow interpret the command. 
So the command data type, I've, I've uh, only defined printing and reading as, as this command data type. So this is like, um, I guess you could think of this as a, as a tiny embedded domain specific language for console interaction. That's a reasonable way of thinking about it. So I'll have to. Um, Why did it not complain about a hole for run before we started to define run? Oh, it's, uh, it's happy for you to, um, I mean, if, if you look at the, uh, it, says, it says here that there is a hole for run. Oh, you do have a hole for run. Yeah. So if you, um, if, if you don't have, um, if you don't have a definition of a function, then it's, it's happy for you to, it will, it's happy to type check that. It will just report that there's a hole for it. So we need to, uh, we need to run commands as well. So running, running our commands is going to be um, given some command of A. Um, we do some I of A, so we'll, I'll just run through this quickly. So, uh, so slightly irritatingly, um, I've, uh, there's, uh, I, I think this is a mistake we made in the library. This should really be getstra rather than get line, but there you go. Um, so what do we do? We, uh, we run the command, so we'll get the result of the command. Um, and then we'll feed the result of that command to uh, f and run that. Okay, so, so once, we've, once we've defined these, um, these potentially infinite programs, we do need a driver to explain how to run them. So this is what run is. Um, and it's complained that it's possibly not total, which is perfectly reasonable. So it's possibly not total because, whoops, we've gone to Vim again. It's, it's possibly not total because, well, can you see the decreasing, um, can you see the decreasing metric here? You can't. That's because there isn't one. So, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, right, no. just accept that this one's partial. This will this will at least get it past the type checker. But I'm not satisfied with this. This is, this is, this is now, I, because this is partial, I might have made some kind of mistake in this program. I need to somehow explain why it's okay to run this program and, and why, why, this is a, why this is a total or an almost total thing. So what I'm going to do is, I talked about this, uh, this notion of fuel. And by uh, running first n on, on streams, we were providing a natural number. And that natural number was, in some sense, the fuel for computing the stream. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm just going to I'm just going to define a data type for providing fuel for running a potentially infinite program. And I'll, I'll, f I'll provide a way of generating a, you know, filling a fuel tank by giving a sufficiently big number that will allow this program to run until it runs out of fuel. And um, uh, fuel looks suspiciously like a natural number data type in that this is your zero and this is your successor. One difference is this, this uh, intriguing laziness flag here. And we'll see in a moment what I'm up to. But first, we'll define a, a total run program that takes some fuel as an input and carries on running our program until it runs out of fuel. So, um, well, if it's run out of fuel, so we'll do this by case putting on the fuel. If our program has run out of fuel, then we give up. If we haven't run out of fuel, then we can do what we did before. We can say, uh, put on the, we can say that uh, we'll get the result by running the command, and we'll then run the rest of the program. But because we want this to be total, we need to say that we've consumed consumed some fuel. So this is like one iteration of the of the engine. Um, so we'll run with x amount of fuel, and uh, we'll run. <coughs> f of res. OK? So I can run this program now um, just, to, just to verify that uh, uh, run total is total. Yes, it is. Um, so I can now run loopy, but I do need to provide an amount of fuel uh, for it to work. Um, so. And it's run out of, after three iterations, it's run out of fuel. But at least, at least, at least we could be productive while, while, while things are, uh, while, while we had that fuel available. Now, oh, question. Maybe, maybe you're about to ask the question that I want you to ask. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it 
so it's 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 um, merging a stream with actions. So it's it's. I mean, this this is uh, this stream. I mean, this is sort of a stream of actions, but we're we're providing some information that says how to compute the rest of the stream. So I guess the answer to that is yes. Yeah, so we are merging a stream with actions. But the, the, the thing that is now, so earlier this was unsatisfying because the run program wasn't total. Now it's unsatisfying because the run program is total, but we have to say how long we want to run for. And we don't necessarily know in advance how long we want to run for. So I'm going to introduce one little cheat, which is I'm going to define a function called forever. This is, this is the um, renewable energy part of the uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, so forever runs forever. And I'd better say that's partial, because that's not going to get past the totality checker. And now I can um, run this loopy program forever. Oh, can I? No, I can't, because I haven't reloaded it. Um, I can now. And this, this will go as long as I'm willing to do this. Um, but run total is total. Um, loopy is total. There is only one thing in this whole system that's not total, and that's forever. So essentially what's happening here is we've said uh, we, we, we have programs. We have an interactive program that's running forever. That interactive program is OK as far as the totality check is concerned. We've got a driver for it. That's OK as far as the totality checker is concerned. And we're just kind of implicitly building a number that's exactly as big as we need in order to run this program. So we do need, at some point, to introduce something to the system to provide enough fuel. But that's, that's all we have to do. Everything else is total. Um, yeah? Why is it beneficial to run G total and have this forever fuel instead of run just as a uh, because I could make a mistake in the implementation of run that somehow makes run loop in a way that was surprising. So run, it's useful for run to be total for the same reason it's useful for any kind of interesting program to be total. What I'm trying to do here is really just minimize what needs to be partial. So, so th li it's literally these, these, um, these two lines of code, forever equals more forever. Uh, it would be it would be a different kind of mistake. So I mean, t totality is not a it's not a you know guaranteed solution to this is going to give us a program that is definitely correct. What it is 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 a good um, it's a sort of good check that things are probably or the, it's it's a good way of catching things which might be going wrong. So I find I find totality uh, trying to write total programs uh, is is a good discipline because you can often catch surprising errors by things which are not total. Uh, so if you, if you try your best to make things total, you're reducing the possible things that can go wrong. That's, that's essentially all there is to it. So certainly you could write run incorrectly. That, that's absolutely true. And it might be that in practice, it's not really worth going to the extent of doing this ridiculous hack. But I guess it just seems like giving this fuel to run total silences any totality errors you might make in that function. But then you, it doesn't seem like Um, so it, it means that any totality errors you make are going to be somewhere else. So, so um, you're, you're not going to like run a command and then forget to run another command. You're not, you're not going to, um, you're not going to miss out any case. So if I say in advance that this is partial, I might accidentally miss out a case, for example, or, or something like that. So it's basically anything you can do to catch errors earlier is good. This is a small thing that, that, is, that, that uh, to do, you might as well do it. That's, uh, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, somehow, at some point, you have to provide this fuel. At, and at some point, you have to provide the driver for the potentially infinite thing. But let's at least set things up so that when you're writing your, your productive program, at least you've, you've explained that properly. Uh, yeah? Um, this, this pattern of like, creating the uh, command structure mm -hmm. it seems to be kind of defining what you, as the author, think is productive. Yes. Right? Um, but I, I was just trying out. It seems like it'll happily accept yeah, so, so, so if it's a case of if you give the wrong type, you'll get the wrong behavior. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> so, so I guess my question is, is there a pattern to kind of specifying that you want the more complex 
behavior to happen in that loop, right? Because intuitively, you would like to you know, get a string and put a string or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's a question of how you define your data type, really. It's, it's uh, I mean, the, the reason I've separated command is, is to make sure that one of those commands actually happens before the loop happens. Right. But you might, yeah, I think what you're saying is, is you might be able to define something that doesn't make sense there in, in terms of the, like, it might, something, so if, if you add something there that doesn't have any effect when you execute it, then you haven't really gained very much. Well, that's certainly true. You still have to get your types right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question here. <coughs> Uh, so, so then, for example, we might say that uh, like loop is actually productive because it interacts uh, indefinitely in a productive way with the external world. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand your question. I mean, so, so if I understand her correctly, that pro by productive it means currently we only mean uh, being guarded by things like yes. So productivity means guarded by constructors. Uh, recursive calls are guarded by constructors, yes. Oh, sorry, that's, that's not what productivity means. That's how productivity is checked. Uh. But, but would it make sense to have the notion of productivity for IO actions so that, so that loopy is productive because uh, it does not go into something like an indefinite I think, uh, I, I mean, I think you might be suggesting another way of defining the the, the infinite I/O type. Yeah, but I, I think there are quite a lot of possible approaches you could take to this. Um, how is it how is it made to be productive? But at the end of the day, it has to get past the the guardedness check, the, the being guarded by constructors. So um, maybe we should talk about this afterwards because I have a terrible feeling that, that we could go on for this. If if I figure out what you're talking about, it will go on too long. Uh, and it will probably be very interesting. <laughs> so let's talk about this afterwards. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is um, so if, if you've got this idea of how um, how these potentially infinite programs can can just run because of the productivity checker, I think we want to move on to um, the idea of defining DSLs that interact with the world just in general. So this whole thing about defining uh, a command response data type and then defining an interpreter that goes along with it is a pattern that I use all the time, like just everywhere. And I want to show some of the sorts of things you can do with it when you're really interacting with the outside world. And we've got about half an hour left, so I think that's probably enough time to, to show a couple of interesting examples of this. And my favorite first thing to do is, um, is to show you the door. So let's show you the door. Uh, so imagine... Um, Imagine you're implementing a system for controlling, maybe it's a robot arm controlling a door opening and closing. Um, and uh, you've, got, um, you've got a buzzer that you can ring. Uh, that buzzer only rings when the door's closed because when the door's open, you can walk through it. Um, so there are a couple of states that this system can be in. Uh, either the door is closed or the door is open. And as programmers, we can, we can, um, we can instruct the door to open. We can instruct the door to close, and, and we can instruct, maybe in response to some uh, button being pressed, we can instruct uh, a bell to ring. So it only makes sense for the door to, to open the door when we're in the door close state. It only makes sense to close the door when we're in the door open state. And it only makes sense to ring the bell when we're in the door close state. This is, this is how the system is working. So we've got these two states, and we've got some actions on the door that only run under certain preconditions, certain post conditions. So um, how we're, we're going to implement that as one of these uh, command response type programs. But I'm going to use the type system to express the constraint that we can only open the door if it's closed and, uh, and vice versa. So uh, this, is, uh, this is how it looks. So this is, a, this is a pattern that you're going to see a lot in the rest of this lecture and tomorrow's Idris lecture. So, so I think it's worth, it's worth explaining exactly what's going on here. So I'm going to define the two possible states of the door, just as a, an ordinary uh, enumeration type. 
So a door is either open or closed. And so we've seen, we've seen a data type a bit like this when, when defining infio and when defining commands. So uh, in this case, I've, I've combined the, um, the, 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 the bind and the command in the same data type, just to simplify things slightly. But it's, it's just like we've seen before, that we're defining a data type for the things we can do. So the things we can do are open the door, close the door, ring the bell. We can return some value, and we can put actions together. But the, the interesting thing about this is, in addition to the value we're returning, we're keeping track of the state of the system uh, in the type. So these two additional um, arguments to door command are, the first one is the state that the system has to be in before the command is run. And then this is the state the system is going to be in after the command is run. So if you read down this type, that's uh, indent it a bit better. If you, if you read down, um, and in fact, that's wrong. That should be uh, door closed. Um, uh, so if you read down this, uh, uh, this type, it says open only works uh, when the door is closed and the door ends up open. Close only works when the door is open and the door ends up closed. And then the type of bind is, is, is needs a little bit of a sort of peering at. It says, if I have a command that starts in state one and ends in state two, and then I have another command that starts in state two and ends in state three, the combination of these commands will start in state one and end in state three. So all of this means that when I write programs using this data type, um, I'm going to have to provide, I'm going to have to do things that, that satisfy the precondition, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to write a program that ends in the state that it's supposed to end in. So let's, let's just, to, just do this in a type-driven way, and we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll see what's really going on internally. So we can use do notation because we've got a bind operator. So if I... Uh, let's say I open the door. So the type of door prog RHS now. So this is a bind. The first thing, it's gone from state one to state two. So state one was door closed. State two was door open. So door prog RHS, which is now expected to be a program that needs to go from door open to door closed. Is that, uh, that making sense? That's, that's the thing that's going to happen. So let's check the type of that. And it says... OK, so this program now, it was going to be something that started in closed and ended in closed. The rest of this program is something that starts in open and ends in closed. So what's going to happen now? Am I allowed to do that? This, this we, one would hope, is not allowed because we can only ring the bell. It only makes sense to ring the bell according to this type. It only makes sense to ring the bell when we're in the door closed state. So let's, uh, let's see what happens. And it says, type mismatch between door closed and door open. So we're working with these interactive programs. And we've already got ourselves, we've already got ourselves um, a way of uh, restricting when you're allowed to do certain actions. So it's, it's, I, I, like, I think of this as um, kind of non-functional correctness. So functional correctness is about a program producing the right result. And I think of non-functional correctness as being correct resource usage or correct, correctly following a protocol. Um, so we've defined a protocol for how to work with the door. And the types here make sure that we follow that protocol correctly. So let's, uh, let's fix that. We were supposed to ring the bell before we opened the door. And that, one would hope, is fine. So that's fine. Uh, so if I just finish at this point, um, well, what do you reckon is going to happen here? This, this, this shouldn't work because the type said we have to close the door after we were done. So this is the, you know, the were you born in a field um, problem. Um, so there's a type mismatch between the door being open and the door being closed. We ended in the wrong state. So we have to make sure that we close the door after ourselves. So let's uh, try that. And now we're fine again. So the fact that this uh, door program is complete and type checks means that we, or the type checker has, has, has verified for us that we've correctly followed this uh, door usage protocol. So um, uh, this, is, this is implemented inside Jim's head, I think, when we go out for lunch. So uh, right, now, what, uh, what, how might we refine this? There's, there's some other things that you might need to do with, uh, with this sort of system. 
Um, so for example, we, we might want to, when we do go out for lunch, we, we might want to lock the door so that there is no possibility of, uh, of, um, of, of opening it at all until it's unlocked. But we might want to ring the bell in both the states where the door is closed and where the door is locked, but not when the door is open. So, so we might need to do a little bit more here to explain when it's OK, what the precondition of something is. So just providing door closed as a precondition might not be quite enough. So let's just refine it slightly. Let's say, right, a door can, as well as being open and closed, a door can be open, closed, or locked. So I've added a, uh, this, so this is the next file along uh, in track five, door lock, if you're following along. So I've added these two, two new commands that just, just for um, getting the other bits of the state machine um, uh, in there. Um, but ring bell, this, this ring bell only works as we've implemented it in the door closed state, which is, um, it's not quite what we wanted. So let's, um, well, let's, let's, let's write a little program. Um, so door prog is, um, so it's, it's currently locked. We want to be able to ring the bell when the door is locked. And then we want to be able to uh, unlock it, open it. Let's just do the whole process, close it and lock it. So we'd like, we'd like this to be a valid application of the door protocol. Um, but as things stand, we can't do it because we can, only, we can only ring the bell when the door is closed rather than locked. Question? Why? Oh, so um, I guess in this case we don't, but it might be that we want to, um, you know, return a, maybe we want to return an int that says how many times we opened the door or something like that. So it, it just, uh, in this case, actually, you know, we don't need it in, in this example, but um, in, in a slight refinement of it, we will. Um, so, um, Let's, let's actually, let's, let's, just to be absolutely sure, let's, uh, let's, let's just, it's bad form to write a program and then not type check it because mm. you might have made a mistake. So let's, let's, let's at least make sure that it works if, uh, if, if we ring the bell while the door is closed. Um, good, that's reassuring. But if I, if, I, if I ring the bell before unlocking the door, um, as things stand, this isn't going to work because there's a mismatch between closed and locked. So what we want to do is somehow allow this to be either closed or locked. We could provide two ring bell operations, but that would be annoying. Um, we could allow it to work in any state. So this, uh, the, the, so remember, beginning with a lowercase letter means it's, uh, it's implicitly bound. So, so this, is now, this is now going to be OK. Nope. Apparently it isn't going to be. Ah, oh, I've done it again. I just like putting Vim up occasionally to remind people that Vim's a thing. Um, what? What's it come? What did I do wrong? Somebody tell me what I did wrong. Ah. Um, oh yeah, sorry. It, it needs um, it needs to not change state. So so yeah, it, it's the the state that it starts in needs to be the state that it ends in. Yes, I don't, I don't know who said that, but have a, have a virtual gold star. Um, OK, so that's OK now. The problem now, though, is that we can ring the bell when the door's open. And then for whatever reason, I decided that that wasn't going to be allowed. So somehow we're going to have to constrain this a bit more so that that's not allowed. So remember yesterday, the end of, oh, not yesterday, Saturday, uh, we looked at predicates on data types. So we looked at LM for lists and calculated whether something was part of the list. So we can do a similar thing here. It, it's actually a bit simpler. We can, we, can, we can write a predicate that says whether a particular state is OK. So somehow we want to expre uh, express that closed is OK and locked is OK, but open isn't OK. So <coughs> just happen to have that down here. Here's what I made earlier. So we can define a predicate on door states that says essentially whether the state represents a closed door. So door closed represents a closed door. Door locked represents a closed door. And because there is no way of constructing is closed of door open, then we'll be able to constrain the states so that um, only, only closed doors are, are valid. So we'll, we'll, stick, we'll, we'll, we'll keep state here. So this, this state type will keep us um, 
as a parameter. But we'll add an extra argument to ring bell that says, I'll call it, I'll give it a name, I'll call it proof for proof. Um, so we need to provide a proof that, the, the, that this state represents a closed door state, and then, and then we're fine. So um, I do need to provide an additional argument to ring bell. Um, <coughs> I'll, I'll just do it as a whole, so for now. So check that that type checks. Yes, it does, but we've got a hole that we need to fill in. And the type of this hole is, well, we need to provide a proof that a door is closed when it's locked. Um, an easy way of providing that proof is just to search for it. So we'll search for it, and, and we're fine. So we have at least been able to represent that precondition of, of this predicate. But there's something still a little bit unsatisfying about this which is that, I mean, I, I did a proof search for this. I did, I, I did an expression search, and the machine found it. And really, it's completely obvious that the state that we're currently in is fine. It should be something that the machine is able to find. So what we can do, is it, so this is an, an additional bit of syntax that, that I haven't introduced yet, is we are allowed to say that this proof argument is implicit and should be constructed by an implicit proof search. So the syntax for doing that is to First, turn it into an implicit argument. So we've seen this implicit argument syntax with the braces. And then the keyword auto says to the machine, solve this implicit argument by expression search. Once you've figured out its type, just look for things that fit. And now if I take this out, it should. Let's just reload it. So it type checked. That was fine. Uh, so it's, it's implicitly filled in that, that, that proof argument. So it's interesting to see what happens if I try that. So if I, if I stick that ring bell after the door is unlocked, then things should still be OK, because it's still, it's still a closed door state. But if I stick it after open, this shouldn't type check. And I didn't test this earlier today, so I'm slightly scared. Let's, uh, let's, let's load it here. Ah, thank goodness. So it says, when we're checking the proof argument, can't value of can't find a value of type is closed door open. So it's, it's in, in those earlier cases, it was trying to fill in that value and it could. Now it's trying to fill in that value and it can't. So what's going on here is we've expressed preconditions and postconditions, but in this case, we've expressed a slightly more interesting precondition on what the state has to be before we make progress. Okay. What would happen if I didn't have an auto there? Um, then it would say, let's just find out what it would say, uh, can't infer argument. So when, uh, uh, what it's trying to do is infer, when, when you have an implicit argument, it tries to infer it by unifying with essentially everything it has available. And here it doesn't have enough available to infer what the argument is. So, so you have to say that this is solvable by proof search. So. Um, when you have implicit, uh, th there are three ways of solving implicit arguments in Idris. One is just by unification. That is, that is what happens if you do nothing else. Another is by this uh, auto proof search. So you have to say you want auto proof search. And the third way is by um, uh, interface resolution. So equivalent to type class resolution. So for that, you have to, it has to be a type class argument. Uh, yes, but in a slightly ugly way. So um, am I, gonna, I, I, I will show you this, and you'll probably be horrified. But um, um, I mean, that, I, I'm, I'm interpreting that question as a feature request, actually, because it's, it's a perfectly reasonable feature request. What you have to do is tell it to show all of the implicit arguments and then print the program. Oh, actually, that's... that's um, that's, uh, that's not actually as ugly as I expected, but only because there aren't many implicit arguments in this. Um, and I, 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 I suppose it might be because the show implicit isn't, uh, it, that, that might actually be a bug. I think, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think there should be more things on display here. So uh, yeah, anyway. That's, uh, that's actually surprisingly pretty. Uh, anyway, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what happens. So it, 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 it shows it here. So we've got 10 minutes left and I wanna, I want to refine this a little bit more because there is still, I've said this about five times today, there is still something not very satisfying about this, 
which is, um, I mean, I, I, I'm saying that this is, you know, the, 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 the thing that we're imagining we're modeling here is some kind of uh, do automatic door opening and closing system, perhaps operated by some actuator or robot <laughs> arm. Uh, what happens if we run that open operation and it doesn't open because uh, it's jammed, say, or it, it's broken? There's some, some kind of hardware failure. Or what happens if we try to close the door and someone's jammed a bin in the way or something and it doesn't close? So, so essentially, what happens if we try to do the operation and the operation doesn't work? So the state machine we're looking at here, we are completely in control of the state transitions. And yet, in reality, we're not in complete control. The world has some kind of input into what happens when we try to do something. Like, just to think of, a, I mean, this, this, this open-closing thing, what, what, what might this be an, an analogy for? Imagine files, opening a file. So if you try to open a file, what state is the file in after you open it? Well, you don't know, because the file might not exist, so you might not have a valid file handle or maybe you're opening it for writing and the disk is full, so you don't have a valid file handle. So you can say what you want the state to be, but then the environment is going to tell you what the state actually is. So somehow we need to refine this to allow the world to say um, what really went on and then reason about that. So on to the next. So this is a, a slight refinement of uh, the door where um, we don't just have a post condition of the operation, but the post condition is uh, the, the, like the, the, the result state of an operation is calculated from the result of the operation. So as before, we're parameterized over some type. This is the, the, the type of the operation. So um, maybe if, you're, if you want to return something interesting, then we're parameterized over that. We've still got a precondition, just as before. This is the state that the door has to be in before uh, we run. But the output, so it, rather than having the output state, we have a function. And it's a function of the result of the operation. So that means that whatever the real operation does, whatever the operation returns, we can use that to calculate the state that we're in. So um, I've added this data type door result, which is either opening the door was OK or opening the door had the door being jammed. And instead of uh, open going from door close to door open, it returns a door result, starts in the door close state, and then the result state is calculated from whatever this result was. So it's lambda res, so res is of type door result. And look at that res. If it's OK, the door's open. If it's jammed, the door's closed. So uh, we're providing a little bit of extra information in the type to say how the world will tell us what happened to the door. So closing, um, I haven't done the same thing for closing and ringing the bell. I've just said that they always work. So closing the door starts in the open state. And this const is a function that just returns its first argument. So, so this, um, this, uh, this will always return uh, that the door closed successfully. Uh, this will always return that the door is still closed. I've added, just for the sake of it, I've added a, uh, an operation that displays something. Uh, that displays a message on the door, or displays a log message. And you can do that in any state, and we end up in the same state. So now let's see what happens if we try to implement that same program on the door. Uh, so um, we'll start by trying to, uh, well, let's ring the bell just because we can. Um, just, just, just to show that ha that hasn't changed the state. So we're trying to write something that starts in door closed. Oh, and it's, it's expanded const. So and it, it's ending in the state door closed. And let's try to open the door. Um, I did call it open, didn't I? Not open door. Um, and if we check the type of door prog RHS now, we'll see something a little bit trickier than before. We'll see um, the state that we're currently in is, uh, is actually unresolved. Um, so case something of if it's OK, the door's open. If it's jammed, the door's closed. So why is this underscore? Well, do notation, if you don't give uh, a variable to bind, it's just kind of throwing it away. So this underscore is standing for the, the result from open that we discarded. So let's, let's, let's assign that to a variable. Check the type of door prog RHS again. And we'll see, OK. Oh, it's renumbered it, but never mind. Let me, let's, let's, let's give it a, a, a name that we haven't seen yet so it's not too confusing. OK, so, um, so it's saying that, that we, will, we will know what the door state is in, whether it's open or closed, 
if we bother to inspect the result of this operation. So imagine, uh, if you will, that you're programming in C. If you write programs with C libraries, they tend to return something that indicates whether the, the function was successful or not. It tends to be an integer. And of course, as good C programmers, we always check the result of that operation before we blunder on and do something. So what we do here is this type is telling us that before you carry on and do something with this door, at least, I mean, we can do all kinds of other stuff that we like, but as soon as we do anything with the door, we're going to have to check whether this was successful or not. It's just a, a type-driven way of saying, please bother to check for errors. So let's do that. Let's bother to check for errors. I don't know why I've put brackets in there. I don't need the brackets. So if we then check the result of this operation, so now we have the two possible results, OK or jammed. And if we look at the type now, the type checker should know, because we're in door prog RHS1, it should know that the value of door res was OK. So it should know that we're in this branch here. It should know that the door at this point is open. So let's check. Yeah, so now it knows because this, this isn't any kind of complicated control flow analysis here. This is just looking at the type. The, types, the type of this operation says that you know, if, if that has a value OK, uh, then the door is open. Great. Um, so we could display a message. Uh, glad to be of service. Um, and uh, then I guess we better close it. So uh, there we go. So that's fine now. And in this case, in the jammed case, um, we now know that the door didn't successfully open. So I guess we could print some kind of message to indicate it's trying hard but failing. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And. Uh, there you go, that type checks. <laughs> You've all read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, haven't you? You, you know where this glad to be of service comes from. If, if you, this is an important piece of computer science education if you haven't. Um, now, just a slight annoyance again, I'm still not quite satisfied. I'm very hard to please, as you've probably established in today's lecture. Um, I'm still not quite satisfied because at this point, I might not want to, or after I've closed the door, I might want to open it again. And it would be kind of annoying to do all this whole rigmarole of opening it and checking the result and so on. Um, and, and if I do, as soon as I've done three or four of these, I'm getting a very deeply nested program. You can sort of imagine this, this case expression is some, somewhere over, the, over here by the time I've opened four or five doors. So there's a, a, a little bit of syntactic sugar that makes this so much nicer in, 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 uh, in Idris, which is that instead of saying Dores, uh, instead of binding this to Dores, I'm going to do a, a, a pattern matching bind, an irrefutable pattern matching bind. So if you're familiar with Haskell, you know you can do this, and you can pattern match on the result of an operation. So in this case, let's just get rid of all of that. In this case, um, the rest of the program. So if I, if I look at foo now, it says, yes, you're in the door open state. We do have um, a bit of a problem, which is that um, door prog is no longer total because I haven't bothered dealing with the error case. Um, so, you know, if I try, uh, I'm, up, I'm up to version six now. Um, so, if I check whether that is total, it says uh, the case block not total due to the case block, not total as there are missing cases. So we do need to find, we do need to provide the alternatives. So um, the way to do this, this is, I was sort of trying to figure out how to do this a while back and um, uh, I was inspired by Perl. <laughs> I just leave a little pause to get a reaction when I say <laughs> that. Uh, and the, the inspiration from Perl was, you know, the, uh, if you're familiar with Perl, you might have seen the, you, you open a file and then you go or die. So yeah, you know that. So so this is this is saying well, o open is either okay or there's the alternative where we've just given up. So uh, give up. So so now we should be total again. So let's let's just verify that we're total again. So we're total again. We've dealt with the error case, and that does mean that I can close the door and I can just carry on. Um, let's. Uh, I can carry on quite merrily opening and closing the door without getting this ridiculous nesting. So, so this becomes really useful if I'm writing long protocols where each step in the protocol might fail. And 
I need to handle the failure here and then give up. So, but we can code to a, a happy path. I'm fond of this phrase, coding to the happy path. So we can code to the happy path of opening the door succeeds and then closing the door, but we can say just off to the side, what happens if we don't succeed? Okay, that, that reassuringly did type check. We're actually done at this point. Um, <clears throat> right, so remember when you enter and leave the room, door protocol. That's, it's, the door is not well typed if you don't close it when you've, uh, when, when you've finished. Uh, is this a question? Yes. Yeah, wouldn't the alternative work if you have more than two? Yeah, so, um, okay, jammed, I don't know, marmalade. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that, that's how you do it. Um, I'm not going to complete that, but that, that's how it works. You can give as many as you like. Um, uh, it's time for me to go home, isn't it? It's just ridiculous. Right, so um, that's basically where I'm going to end for today. There is one thing I... Uh, this is something to look at in the hands-on session, because uh, there was no way I was ever going to get time for this today. But um, just let's think of it slightly more, um, uh, slightly more realistic and a slightly scaled up um, problem along these lines. So if you happen to be... Um, in the business of, of building cash machines. You'd quite like it if your machine is guaranteed not to dispense money until the card has been entered and, and, and verified and so on. So you can uh, implement a, a, a fairly simple state machine that just says either it's ready, which means it's sitting there on the street waiting for someone to insert a card. Um, it's got the card, in, or another state is it's got the card inserted, but the card hasn't been verified to, um, to work with, um, you know, it hasn't been verified to be your card and the pin hasn't been verified yet. And then finally, um, we're in a session where we've actually, we've actually verified the pin and you can, you can give out the money. Uh, so that we'll only get from the card inserted state to the session state if we enter the pin and the pin is verified. So, so this is one of the situations like door opening where the environment tells you whether you got into the session state. And um, I have a friend who works at NCR, the cash machine company. They've got a big office in Edinburgh. And um, I said, with some trepidation, showed him this. I said, I, I thought an ATM might be a good example of this system. And I showed him this saying, I bet you don't do it like this. And he looked at it and he said, no, that's pretty much what we do. It's just that our state machines are implemented in C and we're really careful about it. And, uh, and we actually have a whole stack of state machines underneath. But at the high level, this is basically what they do, uh, he, he said. Uh, so uh, I have an example of this. If you look in the code, uh, you, can see, you can see this example. And I think one thing you could do at the hands-on session, as well as looking at the, um, the exercises that I've put in, just work your way through this. I also have, as part of that code, there is a, a little interpreter that shows how you can implement uh, this data, or how you can implement a driver for this data type at the console. And so you can, you can see this idea in practice of working with state and making sure that the state machine is followed properly. So one final thing I want to say before, uh, before I stop and we can all have a short break is um, I'm still not satisfied. <laughs> and the reason I'm not satisfied this time is um, I would quite like to be able to compose these things. Like I have to, in this, in this uh, ATM system, I've got this message operation, which is suspiciously similar to the display operation that I did for the door. And I'm unable to reuse the code because I'm, I'm, it's part of a different data type. And what if I have two doors? What if I have an ATM where I'm using that door to control the, the bit where the money comes out of? How do I compose these things? So, so somehow I need to find a way to put lots of these state machines together. Maybe I want to implement one state machine in terms of other state machines. So this ATM is going to be implemented in terms of a door state machine, right? a rather smaller door than we're talking about. <laughs> so what we're going to look at tomorrow is some, some of the most recent work I've been doing, which is how on earth do we compose multiple stateful systems? How does this idea scale? So I think it's quite nice that we can talk about protocols. We can reason about um, how... How to, how to make sure things are in the right state and how we follow through a protocol correctly. But in reality, we're going to need to do lots of these at once. And tomorrow, I'll show you um, how I think is a good way of doing that. But for now, um, time for a break. Thank you.